Here we go. So in this section, before we go on to each of the five groups, so that's going to be the next sections that follow, let's look at a little bit of what we do know about the genetics of echinoderms. So the first echinoderm to have its genome completely sequenced, and uh, one of very few to be completely sequenced to this date, yeah, rather annoyingly, is called Strongylocentrotus purpuratus. That's this S purpuratus, uh, and it'll be SP over here. Uh, and so that is the purple sea urchin, and it's a quite lovely thing. I think this is the kind that you would find uh, over on the west coast. Um, and then here we've got, let's see, HS is going to be Homo sapiens, DM is Drosophila melanogaster, so this is a fruit fly, CE is Cynorhabditis elegans, so that's going to be the uh, little nematode worm that people love, and then this NV is Nematostella vectensis, which is going to be a um, Cnidarian, there we go, there we go, yeah, so Cnidaria, bottom of the tree, Nematoda, so these are going to be uh, down there close, to, I think they're in the ecdysozoa, yeah. Um, Drosophila, so this is going to be over uh, with the arthropods, definitely ecdysozoan and panarthropod. Then we jump over here to our two deuterostomes, which are Strongylus and Trotus, which is going to be the sea urchin, and Homo sapiens, which is people, yeah. And so what we want to look at with this thing is not the individual numbers, but the general trend. That's the way to approach this. And so what we see with different organisms, as they get closer to humans, the thing that makes us a little different from other organisms is that we have a lot of reduplication of genes. So whereas other organisms may find a way to absolutely make do with, you know, one or two copies of a gene, we will have many more. So BCL2 right down there, uh, which is involved in apoptosis, like programmed cell death, the flat, the, uh, sorry, um, uh, roundworm nematode, Cynorhabditis, only needs one copy of that. We have 11 versions of it. So it's the same gene that's just been copied and copied and copied and stuffed in different places in the uh, genome. And so comparing the genetics of these uh, just sort of general proteins here, you can see that in the Cnidaria, there are a lot of categories where they have a few or maybe uh, something like zero of these uh, genes. You can see when certain genes appear, like uh, there are a couple of these genes. Uh, the RB is involved in cancer, as is P53. Um, if you ever take virology, there's a thing called the papillomavirus that causes cervical cancer that messes with this P53 and uh, RB pathway. Um, and if you go out in the sun too much, or if you really got to get that tan on the tanning bed, then uh, yeah, if you end up damaging uh, part of this pathway, that's going to be what leads to skin cancer or rather one of the many things that can. Okay, uh, DM Drosophila, you can see it's gonna be like the nematode, but generally it, whatever the nematode has, you're gonna have more of most of these things. And then uh, the next step is gonna be something like either the sea urchin or the human. But if you look, there are some cases where the sea urchin has far more copies of the genes. So this is 129 that we're pretty sure work, and 145 total if you count the pseudogenes, which look like broken, defective, old members of the uh, gene family. The uh, <laughs> This is a cool gene, the death gene, yeah. And it stands for something, but uh, it is involved in cell death, as is dead, yeah. <laughs> this is a thing called a dead box, yeah, which is kind of cool. Um, so uh, death um, and dead, yeah, great. Great uh, protein naming. Well done, science. Yeah, you got it right for once. <laughs> Caspases are uh, very important in starting off one of these uh, cascades that leads to apoptosis. And you can see we've got uh, 14 genes in the Homo sapiens that work on that. And Strongyla centrotis, uh, the sea urchin, has 31 or 33 if you count the two that are broken. Very interesting. So they are, in many ways, as complex as we are, in some ways potentially more complex. So we don't want to think of these organisms as being, I guess, primitive and complex. That is a misnomer, because everything's been here on Earth for the same amount of time. I think it's more that um, you can achieve a little more nuance. You can have more different kinds of organs, a fancier immune system that's able to respond to different kinds of threats. If you have more of these genes that are able to be customized uh, for slightly different purposes, 
doesn't mean you're going to be you're going to live any longer doesn't mean you're going to be stronger or better at anything in particular it just means there are potentially more possibilities uh, that are found within the genome of creatures um, on the deuterostome side yeah so uh, take that protostomes uh, yeah <laughs> one point for the deuterostomes all right um, there are a couple other uh, of these things, so uh, it's kind of kind of interesting, I think. The um, so the immune system seems to be seems to work a little differently in uh, protostomes and deuterostomes, and this is a thing that we would touch on if you were in the immunology course. Uh, the fly uh, immune system is kind of interesting, actually. It's uh, got a vast multitude of these sort of simple immune proteins or things that we have. And then we also have a bunch of different classes of proteins and cells that give, uh, yeah, humans a little bit uh, of a different way to, uh, to interact with things. But uh, here we can see the number of genes gradually increasing. So CE is again Senorabditis. This is our nematode. DM is Drosophila. This is our arthropod. And so those guys are both down there in the Ectisozoa branch. Uh, SP is going to be our uh, sea urchin. And look at that. TLRs are toll-like receptors. They recognize different uh, sort of um, different things that could bump into a cell, and they're like a they're they're a way to uh, uh, activate different cells of the immune system, or set off different pre-programmed antiviral or antibacterial strategies. And if you look at that, uh, the sea urchin is just absolutely loaded with these. We make do with a mere 10 of these things. That component of the sea urchin immune system is actually far more sophisticated than uh, you would find in a human. Um, humans are on par with Drosophila in that way. We, we're both just getting by. Um, we go on and make, uh, both of us go on and make uh, different things on top of this. But uh, yeah, evolutionarily, um, the uh, sea urchins decide, yeah, primitive immune system, fine. But let's multiply it by like 20. Yeah, <laughs> and that's how we win. Uh, over here, Homo sapiens, this is us. And this is, uh, I be believe, Cliona, uh, no, Siona, sorry, intestinalis, which is another chordate, but it's a thing called a, uh, uh, it's basically a tunicate, a version of a tunicate. It's, uh, I think it's a star ascidian is the technical type. But we will cover those later. And one last little set of genes, just so you can see some ways that we are similar and different uh, to the other groups. You've got um, these WENT signaling genes, WNTs. They are going to be involved in carrying signals from the outside of the cell to the inside of the cell. They're a big signaling family. And you can see that they are actually pretty well conserved across all forms of life uh, throughout the animal kingdom. So you've got a lot of these down in the cnidarians and uh, over here in vertebrates like humans, you've also got a lot of them. And in echinoderms, you seem to have one copy of everything. So they've, they've got pretty much everything. They're just missing these uh, two in particular. Humans are missing one. But you can see, like in so many other ways, the humans have doubled up. So we'll have two different copies that are slightly different of some of these went genes. And they will each have subtly different functions. And so uh, similar things have happened in some other groups. Uh, even in cnidarians, they decided to double up on went 7 and went 8. And good for them. Very good for them. So there you go. That's just a little overview of what's going on at the genetic level in echinoderms and how they lead on to uh, creatures like uh, cephalochordates, urochordates, and vertebrates. Urochordates are going to be that uh, star ascidian, the uh, Siona intestinalis. Thank you very much.